let's give one, two minutes more for participants to register and to join us in the meeting. Yes, I think we can start gradually getting to, uh, into the content of our webinar today. Uh, dear civil society organizations, dear colleagues, dear experts, hello everybody and welcome to this um, webinar where we will be exploring the role of the civil society organizations in human capital development with a special focus on opportunities created with the youth guarantee programs. Uh, the, the importance of this seminar in um, context of um, our reality, our economic uh, reality is huge because uh, it is targeted to civil society organization sector. Uh, we are in ETF uh, really strong believers uh, that um, civil society organizations are critical partners that can help public authorities, governments to address the challenges of the target groups at uh, local communities. What are these challenges? The, the challenges are many, and most of them are related to skills issues, to qualifications, to learning about new opportunities, new industry, etc. Well, uh, we uh, tend to always say skills are global. Yes, they are global, but it's very much important uh, when we uh, discuss the uh, issues which are uh, targeting the local communities, we also pay attention to this uh, local notion of the, of the skills. Just to give you an example, in the uh, region of Southeast Europe, uh, in um, other countries as well, uh, we see a huge downturn of the economy. There are a number of um, cities experiencing, for example, deindustrialization, and certainly this creates a crisis closely related to skills development, education and training, and of course, as we in ETF uh, often say, human capital development and lifelong learning. Uh, when uh, we were designing uh, this um, 
uh, webinar. Uh, we wanted to um, give you an opportunity uh, to discuss mainly two uh, critical questions. One of those questions, and which we will be addressing uh, more uh, substantially in the first half of the semi of the webinar, is basically related how can civil society organizations effectively collaborate with governments, educational institutions, and private sector partners to design and implement projects that are responsive to the specific needs of local communities. So this is one of uh, the big questions that we would like to address. Then gradually, we would like in the second half of the webinar to really think what type of collaborative networks uh, can be created with civil society organizations to ensure that youth guarantee programs have meaningful and lasting impact on human capital at local level, on lifelong learning opportunities, education, and uh, training. Now, finally, let me say a few words about myself. I am moderating this webinar and I am uh, very excited and really happy to have that uh, role. I'm senior human capital development expert at ETF and I lead in ETF the work which is related to civil society organizations and their role in human capital development. Uh, having said that, I would like to uh, welcome uh, in the webinar our uh, first uh, speaker, uh, Richard Allen. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, or good afternoon, in fact, everyone. Um, uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, uh, as Michael said, my name is Richard Allen. I work on a project called EU Taxo3, which is a project of DG NIA, um, which supports civil society in the Western Balkans and the Turkey region. Um, oh, thank you. Um, we, we, we work, I mean, in the region, we, we have quite an extensive role, but we, we support um, civil society organizations themselves uh, in terms of capacity development. We also work with governments to try and improve the relationship between governments and civil society and the role of governments in supporting civil society. And we also act as a as a, a bridge or a broker between the European Union institutions and civil society in the region when it comes to things like consultations, um, information gathering, and and so on. That's our main main role. Um, I think it's worth noting at the outset. Um, you know, the youth guarantee is one of um, one of quite a number of EU initiatives that have come to this. To I, I say this region. I'm I'm sitting here in Belgrade. Uh, and I, so I've been in the, in the region for quite some time. So I always refer to this region being being Western Balkans and, and, and Turkey. But uh, European Union is, um, is engaged in this region um, primarily because the region has applied to join um, the European Union as, and, and, and our prospective members. Um, and as you know, I mean, it, but I think it's worth recapping. Uh, the expectations of the European Union are that new member states would have uh, a strong participatory democracy uh, and a vibrant civil society is very much part of that uh, participatory democracy. And so there's a very strong reason for the European Union to be involved and engaged in civil, with civil society in this region um, in terms of supporting that, uh, the development of civil society and guaranteeing that there are, um, as the Copenhagen criteria say, you know, there are kind of robust um, democratic institutions, uh, stable democratic institutions, I think is the word that they use. Um, so, so that's the first thing. I think the second thing is then that the European Union supports civil society very much practically, um, primarily through finance. I mean, certainly through projects such as ours, but um, the civil society facility is a very large pot of money. Um, it, currently, it's about, it's about 200 million euros every three years that is, that is dedicated to building and supporting the civil society in, the, in this region. And there's an equivalent um, pot of money, I think, for Eastern Partnership countries too. Um, I think also it's worth noting that despite all this kind of resource, there's a, there's, there's a very high level of expectation of what civil society is about, and what civil society can do in the region. Uh, and I think some of this um, you can trace back to um, the way in which civil society is uh, what it's like and what it does um, in member states. But I think it's worth remembering that member states have significantly more resource 
than than the the enlargement region here. Um, but the expectations are from 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 the EU side. Um, first of all, that, that civil society organisations are involved in uh, EPA, the, the Instrument for Pre-Accession Assistance, which is um, designed to help these countries um, meet the requirements of membership. Um, and civil society organisations are supposed to be involved in the planning of that money uh, and monitoring how it's, how it's spent. We've recently had uh, the Growth Plan um, uh, initiative um, being introduced to the region. Uh, and once again, there's a very strong expectation that civil society is involved, um, ideally in the planning of the growth plan and the reform facility, but also in the monitoring of that. And it's it's crucial, and from my, my point of view, it's absolutely crucial that civil society is involved in the monitoring in order to make sure that the the the, 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 um, the benchmarks, the, the goals are met uh, through the implementation. Um, along with that, we've got the accession negotiations, uh, and we also we have thematic priorities. We have um, Green Agenda, the Digital Transition, all of these EU initiatives that, that are requesting or requiring um, civil society to be involved, which is a big ask. You know, so we, we're actually, the, the EU is actually demanding quite a lot. Um, one of the things we do as a project um, is to uh, monitor the state of civil society. And I thought it's worth highlighting a couple of um, findings from that monitoring uh, work. Um, in the next one, thank you. Uh, you're, you're reading my mind. Thank you, Erica. Um, uh, in, our, in our monitoring, we try. We we we've got this thing called the um, DGNA guidelines for EU support to civil society, which is basically a set of objectives or set of standards that um, the states, the 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 the, the, the countries are the EPA beneficiaries. Let me say, are, are expected to meet in order to be become um, or to be recognised as meeting the requirements for membership. Of the European Union, and and that's uh, what we do every year is we monitor the state of civil society against those standards, the guidelines, um, and and what I'm going to present is just a, a couple of snapshots from those um, from that research. I think the first thing to say is uh, now we relate it to um, the youth guarantee. It's worth saying that um, when we serve, we surveyed something like nine. Well, we got over a thousand responses, but we. We got around just over 900 valid responses of civil society organisations across the region, and we asked them what they do, and we asked them to, we asked them to tell us the three main things, the three main sectors that they're involved in. And as you can see from this slide, um, youth comes out on top. So it's it's one of the most popular, one of the most um, active, let's say, areas of civil society, uh, which is good for us, um, especially if we're talking about the youth guarantee. So we, we, we at least we've got a base. Uh, of organizations. I mean, in addition, I mean, you'll see down the list, I mean, we've also got in the top 10 here, there are there are more, but um, these are the top 10. Um, we've also got um, rights of people with disabilities. Uh, we've got social inclusion. We've got education, research and innovation, we've got human rights. So there's a number of topics that, that I think are very relevant to um, uh, the implementation of the, the youth guarantee here. So, the, so we've definitely got organizations that are there. Um, I can go to the next slide, please. Right. Um, now, we, we, the other one of the other things that we do with the with the research is to look at um, the state of the relationship between between primarily governments, but but let's say states and civil society, let's say public institutions in a sense. Um, and and I think it, it's very clear from this research that we have very contrasting views depending on where you're sitting. If you're sitting in um, a civil society organization. Uh, and you're asking, you're asked about whether you're effectively in, consulted or involved in the development of policies and laws. Um, only 27% of those organizations said that they thought there was effective consultation. Um, but when we ask um, public officials, um, we get uh, almost a, a, the opposite response, 74%, so three quarters of them, think that civil society organizations are effectively involved uh, in, in public policy making. So we have very contrasting views here. And then when it comes to funding, I think the, the views are even more extreme. Um, across the region, the average across the region is that 15% of civil society organizations think that government or public funding in their country is fair and transparent. I mean, there is a range here. Um, Kosovo is the star of the region. We have 35% of civil society organizations think it's fair and transparent. Uh, the other end of the scale, Serbia, only 5% think it's fair and transparent. So it, it, it's, it's a fairly low base. On the other hand, if you ask public officials, I think all of them 
uh, of the sample that we surveyed said that they think uh, funding of civil society is fair and transparent. So you really do have this very, very different um, starting point when it comes to um, these, the, the, the views of this relationship. Uh, and I think that sets them in some, in a sense, sets them, it's worth bearing in mind when we start talking later on about the youth guarantee and how governments and civil society can work together, that um, in the region, you do have these um, different levels of uh, perception and different um, levels of expectation. So can we come to the next slide? Um, yeah, so I think uh, in, in total, I think, you know, this is a very, very short um, snapshot of, of, of the situation, but I think it's really worth bearing in mind that the situation in the Western Balkans is, is extremely different to the situation in member states. And the Youth Guarantee is, a, is an instrument that started in, uh, in member states and it's now being expanded and enlarged to, to um, the Western Balkans. And I think we have to be very careful that our expectations are not the same um, it's been implementing uh, this in um, in Serbia or Albania is not the same as implementing it in France or Germany. So we have to be careful that there are too many expectations potentially uh, for civil society. That the the background um, the background environment that we're operating in is one of probably greater or enhanced inexperience or unwillingness or even suspicion. Uh, of governments towards civil society, it varies across the region. You know, we have we have different um, levels of positive. We have some some places where there's reasonably positive energy, uh, some places where there's outright hostility, um, and and in many places it, it actually it varies depending on who you talk to. Um, but we have a we have a, we have an issue there. Well, I think when it when it comes to that, and I think that that will be something that will uh, probably at local level is easier to resolve um, than at national level. Um, but it's certainly something we need to keep in mind. And I think finally, I mean, in terms of the challenges, I think um, civil society organizations are uh, struggling. Um, they're struggling to find finance, they're struggling for sustainability. Um, and it's often it's often easier for them to accept funding, to do something. Maybe they're not, it isn't in their core mission, um, simply to maintain um, employment of their colleagues, uh, uh, organization size, um, and it may not be the sorts of things that they really want to do, but they'll do it out of expediency. And I think there's a they they often face this difficulty that they have to make choices, quite difficult choices about their missions, about whether they're really delivering on their missions or whether they um, they apply for funding, which maybe isn't isn't quite in line with what they want to do. Um, and that's something that they need to really think about. So when we're talking about then about how do we how do we go about this then? Um, I think keep in mind that civil society organizations are not agencies. They're not agencies of government. They are organizations in their own right with their own missions and their own goals. Uh, and they need to be treated like that with respect um, and as equals uh, and not as subcontractors. Thanks, first of all. Um, in order to do that, it's really important that then when you're working with them, uh, you find um, areas of common interest, not, uh, and that's a negotiation and a discussion that takes place. And it's not a, it shouldn't be seen as a contracting process. It's about working together and finding areas that, that you can say, okay, yes, these are the sorts of things we can do together. We have these skills, we have these resources. Uh, yes, that matches your needs and, and your things, and let's let's make a deal about this. Um, but not not to see them as, as as organizations that are simply going to deliver on a on a on a contract. Um, as I said, the demands on civil society are very high. Um, and so they're being pulled in lots of different ways, especially the stronger ones. Um, and the funding tends to be um, dedicated. It, 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 funding for civil society organizations tend to be dedicated to delivering a particular purpose, um, delivering a, um, uh, a contract, if you like, or a grant, you know, a grant, so a set of activities, a particular project. There's very little funding for organizational development purposes. Which, which in that sense means that organizations don't uh, have the possibility, they don't have the ability to, to invest in their own capabilities for the future. Uh, they're dedicating the resources they get simply to delivering, a per, delivering on a project, um, and then they're working from project to project and without developing really core strong resources, without investing in sustainability and so on. So I think that's, there's, there's a need to think through that. How if you, if you want to work with civil society organizations, not just to invest in uh, not just to pay for a service, but also to invest in, in future capacity. 
and that's really important. And the other, and the final final thing I think on my list is is don't overpromise. You know, don't don't get into an, a relationship where you think miracles are going to happen. You know, these things are these types of cooperation are things that should start small, should start from learning, should start from understanding each other, um, start from uh, uh, finding that area of common interest and working on it, dealing with it, and growing from a small uh, a, a small level of experience. And from what I've seen with the youth guarantee, I mean, I think the pilot projects. Um, the, the the starting approach, I think, is realistic. I think it's important that it's it's not going in fully fledged and saying, yeah, we're going to solve everything. I think it's really about um, growing uh, and developing and growing from a, from a basis of knowledge and experience uh, rather than from from hubris. Uh, so I think I, I'm not sure if I've used up my my ten minutes, but um, yes. I think, yeah. have I? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. I hope that was uh, I hope that was interesting, and I'm open. I think later on there'll be um, questions uh, and discussion. I'm available. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. Uh, excellent introduction. Uh, let me pick up a few points uh, from uh, what what uh, is interesting. I think uh, this discrepancy that you presented uh, uh, for, uh, on the opinions between. Uh, public authorities and civil society organizations on the consultation uh, when preparing strategies and policy reforms papers. We see obviously that public authorities are very well convinced that they have done consultation and policy dialogue well, while on the other hand we see civil society organizations skepticism. Uh, what I also want uh, to point out, um, uh, in different uh, ETF studies uh, on, on the role of civil society organizations in human capital development, we have uh, confirmed in many ways what you have um, um, also explained. Um, uh, it is uh, really very important uh, to uh, not over promise not over expect of, of uh, developing these relationships, but still we uh, believe uh, that win-win situation for the target group of youth are possible. When I say win-win, I refer to cooperative frameworks that can be established. Thank you so much. And also on the piloting, on the small size projects in order to go I, I, I always say step by step. Uh, before I move to the next speaker, I would like quickly to um, uh, let you know about the ETF study that uh, we have been implementing uh, in uh, our partner countries. And um, we have done the study uh, basically in Albania, Jordan, Serbia, Tajikistan, Ukraine, Uzbekistan last year in Moldova. And this year we are implementing the study in, in Georgia. Uh, the study targeted a specific uh, civil society organizations which, which have been active in informal learning, employment related services, uh, active in non formal formal learning. Obviously, those with uh, organizational profile uh, related uh, to skills development and human capital, lifelong learning opportunities. And um, we uh, investigated four major blocks which are relevant uh, for the sector of education and training and skills agenda. Uh, when it comes to civil society organizations as important potential partners in implementing uh, different projects in the sector. Uh, obviously, the first uh, big section is organizational profile. Uh, then uh, we have in investigated how uh, much flexibility and capacity the civil society organizations have in order to adapt to uh, new and unexpected changes, just to uh, say that actually COVID-19 was a trigger for us to see how these partners act and how much flexibility do they have 
to support their beneficiaries. The third big chunk, which we already started to, in, to, to talk about uh, in the previous uh, presentation is uh, stakeholders and uh, policy dialogue. Uh, figuring out uh, basically how civil society organizations can impact the policy agenda, what are their instruments for advocacy, what uh, type of measures they use, how they act, uh, also uh, providing different uh, training opportunities. And finally, probably one of the most important segments of the study is related uh, to the potential for the future that a civil society holds and what is for them the way forward in this uh, sector. We have been particularly interested to investigate the sector because often in our first encounter with civil society organizations, we face the situation, oh, no, no, we don't work <laughs> in, in human capital. We work in human rights. We work in democracy. We work with um, disabled individuals. So. Uh, that's why it was for us very important also to dedicate uh, this, um, this um, uh, in, um, part of the study to figuring out the potential for the future. Uh, at this point, before I move to Carolina Budurina, who, will, who is going to present uh, the key findings relevant for youth guarantee and uh, civil society, of course, uh, um, from Moldova, which, have, which we did last year. I just want to encourage everybody um, in this uh, webinar to really feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. And of course, if you already have insights to share or questions, please uh, write them in the chat. We will be uh, coming back to them once we are uh, done with uh, the presentations and the input that we have for this discussion. So, Carolina, now the floor is yours. Thank you, Margareta, for uh, having this opportunity to share some uh, findings of the uh, survey and uh, the report that has been uh, elaborated after the um, this that survey has been done, and uh, good afternoon to all the participants and the interest to um, to to uh, join us uh, to the workshop. So concerning the the uh, Moldovan country report, uh, I can say that this, this one represents the findings from the ETF study conducted among CSOs engaged in human capital development activities within the country. Um, next slide, if it's possible. Um, so, um, as uh, Margareta already mentioned, the first uh, compartment of the uh, report uh, related to organization profile. Um, in our country, 32 uh, CSOs participated in this uh, survey. However, more uh, uh, CSOs have been invited to join us and to uh, answer to the questions that have been uh, elaborated in this regard. Um, concerning the um, uh, the location uh, of CSO's headquarters, 56% uh, of uh, uh, interviewed or CSO's uh, have been selected from uh, Chisinau um, because uh, most of them are active in uh, the capital uh, city of Moldovan uh, country. However, we tried to uh, include um, the CSOs from the northern part, uh, part of the country, as well as from the southern part of the country. And um, uh, those who are known for the public or less known from the public, um, those who uh, have local or national level activities, uh, have more or less experience uh, or um, uh, work for a long or a short period of time. Um, based on uh, these um, categories that we uh, decided to put emphasis, we believe that the research results presented in the report are objective and current. Next slide. Um, so, uh, concerning to some beneficiaries of uh, focus of uh, CSO's activities related to skills development through non formal learning and informal learning and services to employment. After the um, uh, af after the categories uh, that have been elaborated and the answers that have been done by the interviewed CSOs, we have found that 
72% of young people are included among the beneficiaries of CSOs. 50% are vulnerable youth and adult people. 38% uh, of beneficiaries were disabled youth and refugees. And 13% are migrant beneficiaries. Among the beneficiaries, uh, 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 less uh, percentage has been found from uh, asylum, asylum seekers, uh, refugees. Um, so uh, we can say that these organizations doesn't mean that we don't have in Moldova, but they are more specific, uh, specialized organizations that deal directly with activities in this field of activity. Uh, among the, be uh, the beneficiaries, the interviewed organizations also highlighted orphans, adoptive families, forced children, and primary school uh, pupils. So these have been the spaces that uh, they uh, have been freely to, to fill in. So we found some other interesting ideas from interviewed CSOs that among the beneficiaries, there are some other organizations uh, who work with orphans, for example, or adopted families, not just direct focus groups um, in uh, human capital development activities. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, if we relate to CSS activities related to skills development, then 50% uh, 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 of um, interviewed CSOs says that, uh, say, said that they uh, are, um, have been interested uh, and still work in delivering and uh, strengthening non-formal learning uh, to young people. Also, 50% uh, they work with uh, providing non-formal learning to adult people. Uh, less um, uh, uh, um, uh, attention has been uh, uh, given for providing services for migrants. So 6% only answered um, uh, for this category uh, of option. 9% uh, uh, say, uh, said that they are working with providing services for asylum seekers. And 13% uh, uh, um, uh, they um, are interested in uh, providing skills development to adult people. Among other activities that have been also freely um, written by um, by interviewed CSOs have been uh, counseling adopting uh, adoptive parents and foster uh, ch uh, children, uh, informing young people with uh, disabilities as well as employers about the programs offered by the government to employ people with disabilities in the field of labor market and also nowadays interview the CSOs um, uh, team work with uh, uh, providing support to fill uh, to filling different kind of uh, documents because they have more experience and um, uh, they can provide such services next slide uh, in my next slide, I tried to, um, um, to structure the information that deals directly with the youth uh, uh, involvement and uh, uh, youth um, uh, activities. Uh, so beneficiaries, if we group, uh, you, uh, you can see that um, uh, um, there are disabled youth 38%, young people 72%, vulnerable youth 50%. Uh, and among activities related to skills development of young people, uh, delivering non-formal uh, learning to young people, 59%, advocacy for young people, 41%, uh, strengthening the informal learning of young people, 34%, and providing skills development to young people, uh, 19%. Um, next slide. Uh, also, among uh, the other um, uh, among the other questions that have been formulated in the survey, um, uh, one of them is the effective ways to implement CSOs activities. And based on the answers that we received, uh, here you can see non-formal training courses is one of the options, which comprises 53%, coaching and counseling uh, people 47%, ensuring the motivation of people to learn uh, 47%, and organizing training courses with formal certificate 47%. In the schema on the right, you can see that less um, preference has been given to using only digital and online training gates, uh, using only traditional, uh, uh, for example, non-digital uh, or uh, online training gates. Um, and uh, one more example is using independent sources for data and other uh, intelligence services. Next slide. 
Um, now I am going to to relate to refer to the CSO's connection with the stakeholders, which was one of the um, question also uh, been um, given for the CSO's um, um, uh, interviewed organizations. Let me say so. Um, uh, based on the answers provided, you can see here that thirty eight percent are not involved in the policy dialogue regarding non formal learning and informal learning and, and employment because of the lack of this uh, interest in policy dialogue. Um, also, 34% of the CSOs are occasionally involved. 22% uh, regularly participate in the uh, in policy dialogue, and 60% express a willingness to collaborate in the uh, policy actors. Um, however, from the observation nowadays, we can say that the CSOs are more interested in uh, uh, having this kind of uh, connection with stakeholders in the policy dialogue, and this openness in more is more uh, obvious. So we, we, we hope for the percentage of um, um, lessening this interest, uh, but it will increase the interest in connection and it will be um, uh, a, a better uh, situation in the near future. Next slide. Um, so uh, some domains that uh, CSOs could strengthen contribution to human capital development sector in the future. Among the answers that have been um, given by the uh, CSOs interviewed, uh, he can you see uh, you can see 62% uh, of them considered accessibility for uh, of formal and non-formal and informal learning. Uh, 48 of them are considered inclusiveness of learning opportunities, regardless of age, gender, ability, citizenship, vulnerability, employment status. Um, uh, 38 of them, percent of them considered the quality of learning opportunities. Um, so uh, some fewer domains uh, that have been uh, considered by interviewed CSOs are 17% knowledge creation, the data collection and analysis, independent monitoring and evaluation of the human capital development uh, sector policy advice. 70% uh, also mentioned about the future of work and policy, uh, piloting innovation of work. 70% uh, also mentioned the digital society and economy. 70% also was the uh, the choice of sustainable living and green economy. And 40% provision and promoting of transversal competencies. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, uh, let us move to the last, um, uh, to the last slide that I wanted to, to relate to today. Uh, some conclusions that um, we come up at the end of um, all the, um, of all the investigation period. Because it was not easy just yes, to interview and to come up with certain findings. But anyways, um, uh, these are the conclusions that um, we from Moldova come, uh, came up at the end of, um, uh, of investigation. So the uh, human capital development sector for a Moldovan civil society organization is one of the at the beginning of the path, we, but with prospects to be developed as a robust uh, sector adapted to the needs of Moldovan beneficiaries. Also, the main groups of beneficiaries in the field of human capital development represent young people, adult and vulnerable groups, and the main activity carried out by CSOs are aimed at covering this segment of the population in the Republic of Moldova. Another finding uh, is that Moldova CSOs do not have does not have uh, CSOs does, do not have enough experience in human capital development. However, we know that we do see this kind of activities, but we are not very well um, uh, experienced and very well prepared. Yes, uh, they uh, we they implement a diverse range of services focused on the formal and informal learning activities for better, easier, and quicker inclusion in employment. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic affected the activities of CSOs in the field of human capital development. Some of the planned activities were interrupted, cancelled or postponed. However, we have um, uh, found that, and the studies finding uh, show that the interviewed uh, CSOs were not uh, significantly affected by the pandemic because their priorities proved to be valid. And the digital tools that replaced the face-to-face -face activities proved to be effective, um, effective and efficient. 
So we have uh, used different kind of platforms in order to continue the activity and not to stop what we have uh, started to do. Uh, CSOs could um, actively participate in and be invited to various national and international events such as conferences, training sessions, and roundtable discussions to gain insights and share best practices in the field of human capital development. And the last conclusion, but not the least, to achieve a greater effectiveness, CSOs can explore a wider range of digital tools for human capital development. This entails acquiring the necessary skills to use specific digital resources that can be benefit their target beneficiaries. So these have been the main results because of the um, of the time that we have been asked to, to to respect and the number of slides also that we have been asked to, uh, by Margareta and the team. Thank you for the opportunity to share the results and um, uh, if there are some questions, I um, I, I can also answer to you. Thank you, Carolina. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, we really got a very condensed and very good picture on the role of civil society uh, organizations in human capital development in case of Moldova. And uh, now I would like to move from Moldova to Albania, from Chisinau to Tirana. And I would like to welcome uh, our uh, friend already, Altin Hazizai. Uh, who is executive director of, of CRCA Albania uh, to reflect on uh, these uh, quite challenging, challenging uh, questions. Let me Altin, go quickly through the questions just uh, that uh, everybody around uh, the table in this webinar gets a clear picture of what, what we ask you to contribute in this knowledge sharing webinar why it is essential for the civil society organizations in Albania to, to collaborate with public authorities within the framework of youth politics. What are the mutual benefits and the key outcomes expected from such partnership? Then can you share an example where a US civil society organization successfully collaborated with public authorities, particularly at the local level to support youth policy? What are the key factors that contributed to this success? What are the lessons you learned in your CSOs? Uh, what is working on youth pol policy? What do you expect that youth guarantee pro program will bring to, to Albania? Uh, so you have 10 minutes uh, time. Please, Altin, share your uh, knowledge around these three key items. Yeah, dear Margarita, thanks a lot. Thanks a million for, for this. Uh, there are wonderful questions. I'll try to, 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 to as much as I can actually to, to answer all of them. Uh, I've prepared a short presentation. Uh, would it be okay if I share it? Uh, I'm not here uh, tech techniques. <laughs> Either am I. <laughs> I'll try anyway. So let, let me see how I can do. It's okay. a short, it's a very short presentation. Yeah, it's about, yeah, this is here. So. Let me hope everybody can. Can everybody see the presentation? Yes, we can see it. Okay, so let me just prepare it for showing. So, yeah. So, uh, I'll try to, to explain as short as possible because I know that the questions are very important to answer. Uh, what we have been doing in Albania and also uh, some of the issues and the concerns we have when it comes to uh, youth guarantee in our country. Uh, when it comes to the youth guarantee, uh, the overall aim it is to support any young people aged between 15 to 29 who are not in education, employment, or training, or otherwise what most of us we use as a as a short term as need. Uh, it is very important because the the program itself is organized into areas. First of all, it has to do about youth employment. What Albania is aiming and what Youth Guarantee aims is that a young person who joins the program, uh, the governments and the authorities should provide him or her within four months with a job placement. While during these four months, the person might need lots of support. I mean, it could be social support, it could be knowledge, etc. 
The second area is about uh, education and uh, youth education and training, which means that the, 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 the two, let's say, operational areas of the program come together to support young people to be integrated into uh, labor market. What, and I can share this uh, as of now, uh, when the program was designed, it did not include, and nobody could think of a risk like this, uh, based on the reality that we have now. Because of course, a program like this, it takes time to get approved. So what we see in Albania as of now, especially this year, but also in last year, it is that a very large number of young people have left the country, have gone to a European Union country, and have found a better life or better education in European countries. So one of the big question marks that the uh, program itself is facing, the country is facing, is lack of young people. Uh, is a huge risk. I have no idea how the authorities are going to deal with this, but I can say it is a fact now that when we want to employ young people in Albania, there is not enough young people to employ. So this is a big question mark that actually has come and the authorities will need to provide an answer. It's a huge risk and uh, other countries should think about it. When it comes to um, when it comes to the role of CSOs, actually, to the youth guarantee, I'll share, let's say, a few examples of our work. When it comes through networking, youth policy development and legislation, youth empowerment, youth services, and I think also this is very very important uh, when it comes to youth guarantee, and of course, some of youth organization also needs to keep in their mind their role in monitoring and evaluation, the youth guarantee itself. Has it been implemented as it was planned? Does it respond to the reality of young people in the country, etc.? So there is lots of questions and the roles that the civil society can, uh, can play throughout the process. In Albania, the youth guarantee has started to be implemented during year 2024. So uh, we are almost at the first year, at the end of the first year of youth guarantee. Um, we are having a meeting with the uh, our national authorities, uh, let's say the, the, at the central level. We're having a meeting next week to get an update of how the program, let's say how the progress has been so far when it comes to implementing youth guarantee, which I have to say this year has been implemented as a pilot project only in three large municipalities, North, Central Albania, and South of Albania. As of next year, the program will be implemented nationally, which means that there are 12 regional authority, employment authorities could be responsible for implementing the program at national level. And each region, usually it is uh, comprised, is made of let's say minimum four, but usually four to six municipalities. Such an employment office uh, would have to provide services for every young people across the region, which is a good thing. And our advice uh, for other countries would be actually that such schemes, they are implemented regionally. So basically having few municipalities coming together to support young people. But at the same time, uh, the role of the NGOs, if you are not a large uh, NGO, lots of stuff that you can join the, the let's say, the, the, the national scheme of youth guarantee and support, let's say, any of the measures that are, being, that are going to be implemented. Uh, if you are a smaller one, I strongly believe that there is, across the country, there is different roles, small and large at NGOs, can play when it comes to the implementation of the youth guarantee. Mm -hmm. I'll go through 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 few of the elements in there. Uh, for example, when it comes to youth networking, our strong uh, recommendation for any NGOs that would like to join the, the youth guarantee and be part of it, be part of the, uh, let's say, implement, implementing process, would be not to be a single unit, let's say. It's rather suggested 
uh, to, 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 to be part of a network. So in Albania, we support the Albanian National Youth Network. And through the network, we can play different roles across, let's say, Albania. But also, it means that we are a bigger voice uh, in terms of networking, public policy, budget influencing, etc. cetera. Uh, the overall budget for um, the youth guarantee in Albania is almost 60 million euros, out of which I think 40 million are, are placed, are put by European Union, and the, the, the rest of the amount is uh, a contribution from the Albanian government. And that also, uh, it's rather a good thing to see that countries, not only EU, but also countries are investing for youth employment. I'm sharing a few pictures also, I mean, just to, to share the level of, of consultation, but also the kind of work that we do in Albania. When it comes to youth policy uh, legislation development, uh, we have been part of the consultations to do before, and this is also very important to learn, uh, don't wait until youth guarantee has been made uh, a final document, because then the opportunity to uh, let's say, provide an opinion to upgrade the document, to change the document, it's far more difficult compared to when you start participating in the planning process. Uh, in Albania, we have had several institutions and several ministries who have been dealing with this. Some of them do not have the experience to work with the NGOs, but right now, uh, there is at least a clarity who is a responsible institution and through that uh, institution, we are able to work together, various NGOs and CSOs together with authorities, of course, to support, uh, let's say, the, the NGO, uh, whether it is a new legislation, whether it is a policy, etc. cetera. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have what we call the national meetings, consultations on the youth guarantee. Usually they take place minimum once a year. And through that, we also, get information by the, let's say, special employment authorities on the uh, current developments and the progress towards the youth guarantee. Uh, when it comes to youth policy, and this is a bit tricky also, we have a ministry for youth in Albania, and they are responsible for uh, youth policy. So uh, when it comes to influencing policy and legislation, it's also good to know who are responsible parties, and what is their impact when it comes to youth guarantee, and how the, the various ministries and authorities can come together. Sometimes this can be very tricky. Uh, this is the last meeting we had actually about uh, youth legislation in Albania. Our youth law is changing. Uh, so uh, we had several uh, consultations with uh, different organizations, different CSOs, different authorities, to support the level of consultation, which is very important for young people to uh, provide their opinions and to influence, of course, legislation and policy. Uh, when it comes to empowerment, I think this is very, very important. As I said, we mostly support the Albanian National Youth Network. It's one of the largest youth networks in Albania. It's mostly NGOs, but also youth groups. So you don't have to be typically a formal NGO or a youth organization to be part of such networks. You can start as a volunteer group, and then once you have grown up and you understand how the civil society works, how angels work, and you can register the NGO. So I think it is very, very important to have as many young people coming together and be able to support uh, their role, their work, their what we call it, their empowerment. In terms of uh, youth uh, guarantee, what we have understood so far is that there are few roles for NGOs to support, let's say, youth empowerment. Not that it is impossible, but uh, that's what we see what, as one of the gaps. If the planning was done better in the uh, original consultations, probably there would have been more uh, focus into what we consider youth empowerment. And that in includes also social empowerment, not typically, typically uh, let's say preparation or vocational training or uh, any kind of education young people can get when it comes to youth employment. Uh, many young people come from difficult circumstances. So their preparation for uh, employment, it shouldn't include only, let's say, 
getting knowledge and know-how on how to do your job, wherever, uh, whoever is going to be your, your future uh, job. But at the same time, to understand that lots of these young people, they have social problems, they have, uh, they lack some of the life skills that are very important for your personal well-being. So uh, what we are asking now for uh, Albania and our authorities is to adjust some part of the program uh, when it comes to, uh, let's say, a better balance between youth education for employment mixed with uh, life skills, social support, uh, but also any kind of support that young people might need. And I'll take an example. I mean, uh, we work in various areas of Albania. Uh, in Korcha, we had this young person. Uh, Korcha is not implementing the youth scheme, but we're thinking if the young person was implement was part, so wanted to join the youth the guarantee, how would it be possible to support this young uh, person? And the person did not have a house, was sleeping on the street. And the youth guarantee does not support housing or let's say uh, any kind of youth support uh, for housing or safety or shelter. So in that regard, there is some questions that we need to adjust the program to the reality of young people, especially because, as I said, most of the young people we work nowadays who are not employed, who basically who are need, are those coming from the most difficult circumstances in their lives and most difficult communities too. Uh, when it comes to youth services, I've been sharing some of the work we do actually in, in Albania, but the, the, the most important aspect that we are piloting now, and I hope uh, will be part of the, of the youth guarantee scheme as of next year, is what we call it uh, one-stop shop for youth employment. And the idea it is in one single place, uh, which is working uh, in Korcha region, is approximately, let's say, if we drive, it will be around 200 kilometers from Tirana. Uh, we are trying to bring municipalities, authorities, youth organizations, and young people from or every school, actually, uh, in the in uh, this region, in Korcha, together with young people which are not in education or any training, etc., to try to pilot this kind of intervention where young people do not have any more to go to 1,000 places to find information about whether this is worry, this is education, or uh, let's say uh, any other opportunity that young people need, but is rather bringing them in one single space. So far, I mean, the, the, the center has been working very well. And right now, for example, we're in a process where we are uh, meeting with young people across gymnasiums, across schools, across youth centers, and through, of course, youth organizations, because, and I'm, I'm making this very clear, part of the work that angels can do when it comes to youth guarantee is to identify, to approach young people who are not in education and training. So the question is, how do you identify these young people? Where are they? Who are they? What are their needs? And how they can be adjusted into the all youth guarantee program. So uh, this uh, intervention actually is giving us an opportunity to say to the young people that by having this information office that provides information about trainings, capacity building, uh, personal empowerment, employment, etc., it means that the young people have an entry point, virtual and physical, in one single place without having to go to, as usually happens to most of us, you know, like in 1,000 places to get that kind of information. Okay. Uh, this is, I'm at the right at the last slide. So okay, <laughs> perfect. I know what you're going to say. <laughs> so this is this is our center actually, uh, and it is extending because now we want to attach also a social center next to it, so young people can come in there and get information about it. Part of it, as I said, is the information. Uh, so we organize lots of workshops and open meetings, public meetings, road shows, etc to meet with, uh, with young people. The last one is about monitoring evaluation. If you are an agency that you are specialized about typically 
monitoring public policies, how they are supporting young people, etc. I would suggest don't go into the whole scheme of youth guarantee. Focus into monitoring evaluation, which means look into the results that the youth guarantee can bring for young people. That's my presentation. And really thank you for making me part of this. I'm, I'm really happy about it. Thank you so much for this really context-rich uh, presentation. Uh, you really may, uh, make it... Uh made it really uh, very concrete how civil society organizations can see themselves uh, in this uh, youth guarantee program. Uh, uh, thank you, Altin. Uh, I would now uh, uh, want to uh, zoom out and to move to my colleagues who will provide important input uh, on youth guarantee. First, um, my colleague Matthias uh, Temel will present, um, will zoom out from the European Training Foundation Youth Guarantee in the Western Balkans. And also he will be uh, talking about one very important actor, which is often forgotten by civil society organizations and also sometimes by the government, social partners. So Matthias, thank you. And the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Margareta, and hello to everyone. I wish you a good afternoon. I'm calling in from uh, Pristina, where I have a very interesting time uh, talking to civil society, among others, and also the social partners. And I'm very happy to, to contribute to this session. So thank you, Margareta, for the invitation. Um, I have, uh, I'm going to present two different things. The first part, which is starting now, is to have, as Margareta just said, uh, on the youth guarantee in general, I'll keep it short, and then another short uh, segment separate uh, on the on the social dialogue and, and social partners. Starting here uh, with um, the youth guarantee, a little bit of background just to, to give you uh, a, a hint of, of some basic information. Youth guarantee has originally started in, in 2013 in the European Union as a response to uh, the financial crisis that started in 2008 and 9 and uh, resulted in a very drastic increase in of youth unemployment in EU member states. At the time, uh, it was decided uh, that all the EU member states would uh, jointly engage in this uh, youth guarantee program. And the very core of the youth guarantee program, the idea was that youth who are in need, not in employment, educational training, in the age group uh, 15 to 24, at the time, now it's different, now it's uh, 15 to 29, but so it started uh, with a smaller age group to get within four months uh, of becoming unemployed or leaving education, a concrete offer which will help them to find a uh, back a track, uh, some, some kind of a, key, a career perspective. So this offer could be four different things. Either they would go straight uh, into a job or employment, or if that's not possible to go into apprenticeship, some sort of uh, dual education or a traineeship, which is also work-based learning, but perhaps a shorter duration, or uh, to go back into formal or non-formal education uh, and come out with uh, additional qualification and uh, you know, um, uh, uh, formal um, you know, certificate of, of, of completion. Uh, as you can see in the little box, uh, there were quite strict quality uh, criteria attached to these four possibilities. So it couldn't be just a little traineeship of two weeks. No, it had to follow certain uh, quality criteria which are laid down in the European documents that are listed there. So the, the overall uh, ambition was very high, a very short period of time of four months to give the youth one of very four very solid options that, uh, that integrates them in the labor market. Uh, next slide, please. So if we now look into the region of the Western Balkans, uh, <clears throat> a decision was made uh, at ministerial level in 2020 to adopt the youth guarantee as it was started in, in Europe, also for the Western Balkan uh, economies in the six countries. Um, and the background, uh, as you can see here, is uh, we got uh, the statistics for uh, needs uh, again for the for the six countries, 
from the year 2023. And this is now the age group 15 to 29, because mean, meanwhile, the youth guarantee was extended in the age bracket from 15 to 29. Um, for obvious reasons, because young people at the age of 15, they are still in the process of learning, you know, getting their formal education. Later on, they might either start working at a younger age or they go to university for tertiary education, finish that, graduate from university at the age, let's say, 24, 25, and have the challenge to uh, find entry into the labor market, where particularly in the region here in the Western Balkans, there's many of those university graduates which cannot find access to the labor market. As you can see, the figures are quite high. Um, the numbers that you see represented here, they are, they are uh, kind of representing a very diverse group of people because I, I hinted at it, there might be the young ones which have completely different uh, needs. Uh, they need different services than the older ones. Uh, usually, uh, and we can move to the next slide, there is a difference between male and female uh, needs, uh, whereby female needs are very often uh, find it even more difficult than, than male young people to, to enter the labor market. And young uh, women uh, have much less tendency to seek services out, uh, as you can see in the upper uh, right hand box. Uh, they have uh, less propensity for job search. Um, and other issues that we see coming out of the data that we, that we have from the region is um, increasing inactivity. These are very often people who have been disappointed, uh, they are, have lost motivation, they have lost um, you know, a vision for the future for themselves and have kind of given up, which is very sad. And, and these are often the most difficult uh, to reach and to find and to motivate people to, to join this kind of program. Other trends concern uh, skills mismatch. Uh, and what we observe also is that um, there's in the region, there's not yet uh, enough uh, provision of uh, second chance type of education. So non-formal types of education and qualifications that are suitable for the older age group, let's say, you know, 23 up uh, to catch up on certain skills that they could not learn at school or at university. Uh, and one important potential that we see for this age, uh, for this age group are digital skills. Uh, well, that's an economic sector that's developing fast. Many young people are interested in that kind of um, IT-related uh, work, uh, but also their entrepreneurial uh, skills and capacity and potential that is interesting to you know, find solutions for uh, this type of group. I would like to sum up on, on the Youth Guarantee Program as such. Uh, it's a very demanding program. Uh, it's very new to the region. It's even considerably, kind of, we could say, relatively new to EU uh, member states, uh, just, uh, just about 10 years, which is not too much of time. And one observation maybe from the work we've been doing at ETF with countries in the region is that by starting the Youth Guarantee, in places such as Albania and other countries in the region, there was a lot of, uh, you know, a push to uh, the policymakers to make changes in the education policy, in the employment uh, policy, in the youth policy. We're um, talking here from Kosovo. All of these policy areas have been undergone massive change and massive um, uh, reform because of the youth guarantee. And that's an interesting uh, dynamic. Okay, so uh, that's in a nutshell on the youth guarantee in general. Now I would like to switch uh, to my next uh, topic. We've uh, heard uh, so far the, the webinar was uh, about the civil society organizations and, and their role in the youth guarantee. Uh, civil society uh, is very important as we have heard and there were many good examples of that, but let's not forget the social partners um, and the social dialogue, which is also important for this kind of for social economic policy that we're talking about, youth, youth policy, employment policy. Now, let's, I, I would be like to be really short just to, you know, make a few points about uh, social partners and uh, social dialogue. Social partners, of course, they are the representative organizations of employers, those who give the jobs, and the representative organizations 
representing the workers who those who seek jobs. The two sides of the labor market. They are the labor market. Employers and workers are the labor market. And uh, social partners uh, in that sense of representing the two sides of labor, labor market have an extremely important role to protect the rights uh, of everyone you know, in the labor market, protecting uh, very often the rights of workers, but also making sure that the economic development can take place and that the two interests of economic development and social protection are in balance. And in that sense, they are also, you can say, social partners are the defenders of social and economic democracy. That's what they do. We make sure that these uh, two sides are developing in a democratic uh, way. Social dialogue, of course, is now the institutionalized dialogue, uh, institutionalized uh, negotiations, consultations that are taking place between either the two sides of the labor market or also including the government, in which case we talk about the tripartite uh, dialogue. Uh, and in most cases, and certainly in the region and certainly in, in EU accession candidate countries, uh, social dialogue is in a way formalized. So there is a legal basis for social dialogue to take place. There's certain laws, usually labor law or social um, economic related laws that define that this social dialogue is taking place, who is um, in charge of participating in a dialogue, etc. Uh, in that sense, uh, social dialogue is different from civic dialogue. So for um, if we say uh, civil society giving input, uh, consulting with the government, that would be, uh, could be called a civic, civic dialogue. It's just, it's a similar uh, purpose, uh, a similar importance, but the uh, difference is that the civic dialogue usually is not enshrined in law, uh, not in, in many countries it, it can happen. Now, if we talk about, if we take a step back and look at the EU system, uh, social dialogue is at the core of, of uh, social economic policy making. There is no decision on social or economic policy without social dialogue. It cannot be, it's, it's, it can't be done. Uh, and this is why social dialogue is very important for accession countries, uh, because you know uh, approximation to EU standards and, and systems uh, has to include social dialogue and the capacity of social dialogue to respond to you know the big questions of, of social and economic development. Civic dialogue again is just as important, but works in a slightly different mechanism. Right, uh, next slide, please, Erica. Now, uh, ETF has been engaged in uh, Albania, and I'm sending the greetings to uh, everyone participating from Albania, uh, in looking at the youth guarantee and how it has been conceived and how it has started operating. Even uh, last year in 2023, when the pilot, before the pilot was actually started. And, and so ETF um, uh, started into um, communication with the different actors in the youth county, of course, government um, actors, uh, civil society actors, social part partner actors, to see what's going on, how is this, um, what are the first steps and, and how is it going. Now, um, of course, we came in uh, with uh, our views and our um, learnings from EU member states that uh, the more you know, uh, civil society and social partners can be included in the whole design and in the whole startup of the process, the more, you know, we feel effective and successful the, the start of implementation will be. And we looked at uh, specifically the, the possibilities for uh, social, uh, civil society and social partners to, to involve. I sum up on this slide very briefly what some of the findings. If you look uh, that, that's the first line here on the slide. Uh, the policy cycle, you have typically those four phases uh, and social partners, now I'm talking again about social partners, will be very important uh, in agenda setting and formulation, that's clear. And they have been involved for the youth guarantee. Uh, quality of involvement can be debated. Some might uh, have, you know, there might be different opinions on that, but it's been included and it's very important. Now we have moved in Albania, we've seen um, the pilot has started. Now we are in the implementation 
and social partners will be important to be actively involved in the technical working group that has been established. Also, all the levels of, of governance, which is technical, inter-institutional, local partnership network. And then at the same time, monitoring evaluation is important where, again, social partners and CSO, but now we're still talking about social partners, are important. Implementation of the youth guarantee has four phases, usually mapping, outreach, preparation, and offer. And down in that second line, you can see typical contributions that social partners can uh, make in these different phases of the youth guarantee. It goes from information collection, information sharing about the target group, who are the needs, where to find them, what are you know detailed uh, needs of, of this target group, and how can they be helped. Outreach would be, again, going out, finding them, knowing who they are, how to mobilize them, how to motivate them, how to get them into the program uh, in the preparation phase. It's, uh, and that's, I think, an interesting phase for civil society and social parties, because this is where the government should involve in the provision of services all these other stakeholders, you know, provide funding so that civil society and social partners can offer specific services to the youth. Uh, and the offer stage is perhaps, again, more formal, where you need formal uh, education providers or uh, very specifically the collaboration of employers uh, to provide jobs, provide traineeships and apprenticeships. And this is where I see a particular importance of, of the employer uh, associations and organizations. Yeah. Oh. I hope with that I could sum up. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Margareta. Okay. Over to you. Yes. Thanks, Matthias. Uh, this is also uh, particularly important uh, that uh, civil society organizations taking part in this webinar take a note that actually engaging in youth, youth guarantee in the projects for youth guarantee um, it is important to keep in mind what you, Matthias, stress about the so social partners. They do hold the knowledge uh, about the local um, employment possibilities, about industry developments, about the trends, and therefore they can be important partner in any project which could be proposed by civil society organizations. Now I move to uh, Syria as a last uh, speaker in the webinar. Syria, over to you. Thank you, uh, Margareta, and uh, every speaker, and especially uh, all participants. Um, I will uh, look into you know, what uh, partly has been said, but also adding the perspective of uh, this um, cooperation and partnership between uh, different stakeholders. And the youth guarantee is really offering uh, this opportunity, and the opportunity should be really uh, taken. Um, here, again, a graphic representation of the youth guarantee in practice. Uh, Matthias already uh, explained that there are four main phases, uh, mapping phase, identifying the uh, young people, reaching out to the young people, preparation, and then offering uh, either a job opportunity or training opportunity. But what I want to highlight uh, uh, in this graph uh, that it also adds what are the important uh, uh, enabling uh, um, factors. And we see horizontally that there are three supporting, uh, uh, very important supporting pillars. And one is the mobilizing partnerships is the first one. Then we have uh, improving data collection uh, uh, and monitoring of schemes. We heard how much monitoring the progress and utilizing the data is important to see if the youth guarantee is going in the right direction or if there is something that uh, um, needs to be uh, improved. And last but not least, making full and optimal use of funds. But as we are talking about social partners, civil society organization, I want to focus on this important enabling factor, which is mobilizing partnerships. And mobilizing partnership is an issue of governance which we can see more in depth in the next 
slide. So if we take uh, uh, the um, the mobilizing partnership, we had to put on our uh, uh, governance lenses and observe the youth guarantee, um, not only in the way it is implemented with the phases, uh, with different uh, uh, number of activities, but how this can um, uh, organize and what are the implications of uh, his implementation. And first of all, we have just seen that uh, in the youth guarantee, there is an interplay of different actions, uh, informing, mapping, reaching out, uh, uh, offering uh, an opportunity for learning and for employment. Uh, and these actions uh, uh, also happen at different levels. There is something that needs to be organized central, centrally, other things that are, um, have place in a better way uh, locally. So we have this interplay. Um, and of course, with different activities and different actions, there are different responsibilities, whereby we have really to highlight in the youth guarantee this dimension of stakeholder cooperation that it's really important. Without this um, interaction of different actors and cooperation among them, it is very difficult to reach, uh, to attain a good result in the youth guarantee. Uh, but who are these actors? Uh, simply put, we have, uh, of course, government uh, representatives. We have different ministries. Normally there is a labor and social affair ministry who is in the lead, but there are also implementing agencies. And typically the public employment service uh, is the key executing agency when it goes to the youth guarantee. But at the same time, uh, we have just heard that there is an important role for the employers because they are those who demand young people, skilled young people, uh, they are interested or they may be potentially interested in offering an internship, apprenticeship, uh, or even an employment, longer term employment opportunity. And we have civil society organizations. I don't need to repeat that. We heard uh, uh, previous speakers uh, to highlight uh, much better than what I can do. Uh, the value that civil society organizations can bring to the youth guarantee. Um, from our study in ETF, which Margareta mentioned, uh, we learned that uh, uh, there are three important characteristics of civil society. They are very close to the population, including a uh, young population. They have uh, good methods to understand needs. They're very strong in need assessment, and they're also capable of innovating, delivering and providing uh, service in, in, uh, in a new manner, in a refined, fine-tuned manner. So in terms of implications for the governance of the youth guarantee, it's important to recognize that all these stakeholders have a place, have a role to play in the youth guarantee, and they also have different strengths. Uh, for example, civil society typically are very um, very strong in reaching out, understanding the needs, but also empowering. Also, we heard from uh, Altin as well as from Carolina. Um, they, they, they have practical experience out of it. Uh, social partners are very strong in the phase of uh, uh, preparing and making an offer. So selecting the young people and uh, um, including the young people in, in the companies, be it small or, 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 or big companies. So different stakeholders, they all have a legitimate place and they have different strengths. They have their own specific added value. This is important when we think to the design of, uh, uh, of the youth guarantee scheme, in the governance, in the management of the youth guarantee schemes. So is coordination important? Of course, coordination is important. And uh, in any youth guarantee scheme, we spoke about Albania, but we can speak about any other countries, 
in Western Balkans, the European Union, uh, uh, there is very much a similar structure with the interinstitutional working group to coordinate also inside the government and between the government and uh, non-state stakeholders. And there is also a more uh, uh, technical coordina coordination at more operational level. And uh, last but not least, uh, there are also platforms at local level because then implementation takes place in a given uh, area, a municipality, region. Uh, so the territorial dimension, uh, it's absolutely uh, crucial. Uh, what's the governance implication? The governance implication is that uh, we have to think or planners have to um, provide for resources. This coordination doesn't happen uh, um, alone. There is a need for, all, for planning coordination. There is a need to put resources. There is a need to establish uh, agreement uh, mechanism to coordinate between the different actors. So it requires really an intention. We cannot think that coordination happens, um, you know, without this dedication of resources. So this, uh, when it goes to say the lenses, so the observation of the governance in the next uh, and last slide, I just want to illustrate uh, uh, briefly what, what has been the ETF methodology in Albania. I think everybody understood that ETF uh, is providing uh, uh, support or at least uh, uh, sharing some ideas and expertise with Albanian authorities and Albanian social partners, Albanian uh, civil society organization in terms of uh, um, utilizing the pilot, the pilot youth, this stage of pilot youth guarantee to learn as much as possible how to improve this governance uh, uh, arrangement. So we um, have applied the, the, our method, which we call learning, taking action and making dialogues in governance. And we have uh, uh, deployed this methodology in four uh, points or four uh, phases. First of all, uh, uh, carrying out the fight funding. So assessing the situation. What is the situation of the youth guarantee in Albania? And this was very useful to really understand what uh, was going on and to somehow appreciate uh, a little bit of perhaps a partial mismatch to what was on paper, having this interinstitutional working group, technical working group, uh, platforms and so on, and the reality. And in reality, um, it, there was not perfect correspondence. Huh? It, it's coming, it's coming, but it was important to, uh, to have uh, a baseline and to see, okay, where are we? Is the information flowing between the different stakeholders? Yes or not, what can be improved? So taking stock of the situation. Uh, second, uh, as a part of the methodology, given that uh, the mismatch between uh, the plan on paper and reality uh, was at least partially there, was to discuss the findings with, uh, with local authorities, but also with equally uh, with civil society, social partners to agree on, uh, uh, on working meetings, which were implemented in three, uh, in three cities, in the three pilot cities. And we found that these um, initial working meetings, hmm, they are not to replace any formal governance structure, not to replace the interinstitutional group, not to replace the technical group, but just to form a common understanding, find a common language. And actually, even more than that, we realized that uh, uh, there is a common interest very strong, which is precisely what Altin told us a few minutes ago. Government, civil society, social partner, they all see this um, challenge of young people emigrating and finding job opportunities, better living abroad. So there is a strong uh, drive and strong motivation to cooperate in order to 
create possibilities for young Albanian to find good living in Albania as, a, as alternative, if they want, as alternative option to emigration, or at least uh, uh, potential uh, conditions for coming back to Albania. Uh, so very important, common understanding, common vision. Thirdly, we are now collecting uh, um, qualitative information from three member states and for the purpose of knowledge sharing. So we will organize a, a direct exchange between representatives of Belgium, Estonia, Slovenia, and uh, Albanian stakeholders. Again, this is part of uh, the learning, you know, digesting the situation, how things can be arranged, how other countries are doing, what can we learn from experience of uh, uh, countries that have been doing youth guarantee for uh, 10 years uh, now. Um, fourth step, which will come, uh, we hope, we want to move to the action, from learning to action, acting upon the learning. Is it possible to foster partnerships to reinforce the youth guarantee? We believe it is possible. We also know that this is the um, say the, the push and the invitation and the desire of the youth guarantee. You remember the previous slide about um, building partnership as a, a really enabling, enabling factor, as an enable, enabling condition. Uh, what does it mean to have partnership? It means to move from uh, occasional exchanges, uh, ad hoc exchanging, onto more uh, regular even, let me say, institutionalized uh, sharing of information, um, collection of data which shall be available to be assessed and understood by all partners, not only by a small group of technical people, so anyone can really see how the progress uh, um, is, is going. Um, sharing practice, taking moments. We heard also from different members say in, in Estonia, Slovenia, they organize beside the formal structures. Governance is also made by informal moment of exchange, moment in which the different uh, uh, stakeholders tell, you know, how the project or the activity or the initiative has functioned what is working, what is not working. It's part of uh, accumulation of expertise and it really is very useful in order to reinforce the trust. This open sharing of information, it creates a stronger um, glue uh, inside the, the members, between the, the members of the partnership um, and so on. Until, of course, ideally the partnership can grow and reach a level where there is really contribution to decision making. It's not only yeah. sharing information or knowledge, yeah. but really uh, making a, a contribution to decision. Uh, yeah. I know Syria. the time yeah. is over, so yeah. I will stop here. And um, yeah, that's the story I wanted to tell back to you, Margareta. Very important story indeed. And um, uh, it's excellent to, in a way, conclude uh, with this uh, governance story and um, where actually the place can be found for better cooperation, for better partnerships among different, different stakeholders. I promise that we will have time for the questions, but unfortunately, it's not the case. We are scheduled until 4.30. We are two minutes beyond the time. I don't uh, uh, want to make a pressure on you because I was looking in the chat and I didn't see any question. On the contrary, I saw a lot of enthusiasm and introduction of different civil society organizations who are doing many interesting things in uh, different countries uh, in the Western Balkans. For example, SEGA, we have, we have um, civil society facility program here in the chat. Then we have uh, CSO's environment and youth capacity development program, uh, profile, I'm sorry, but 
Okay. Yes, then we have Imor, we have different partners who could potentially work. Uh, we have NV, National Life Association uh, from Turkey. Thank you very much uh, for introducing yourself in the chat. I, I owe you additional webinar in the near future where we will have possibility in an open um, conference scenario to uh, reflect and to discuss among ourselves what could be uh, something that ETF can concretely offer to those of you as a civil society organizations uh, who can uh, who would like to engage uh, in youth guarantee programs. Coming back to civil society organizations, I want to particularly stress two key takeaways uh, that I would like to resonate as a conclusion of uh, excellent input from different um, colleagues and experts around the table. Uh, first is that uh, the civil society um, organizations could be an excellent partners in youth guarantee programs. This is the first uh, uh, takeaway uh, for us. The second uh, takeaway is that in partnership with other local actors, local, regional, and national actors, civil society organizations can contribute to create a win-win situation at local, regional, and national level. So to turn actually human capital devastation in a real human capital development, to prevent further uh, brain drain, to prevent uh, a leaf of talent around beautiful uh, countries, around our beautiful countries. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just a final note, uh, in the chat, uh, there was an excellent invitation, which I would like to encourage a lot to, for you to consider. Uh, as um, our partners in Azerbaijan are hosting uh, unbelievable global development COP29 in a fantastic city of Baku, Azerbaijan took initiative to create a global NGO forum, which will be uh, dealing with climate things in the in the in the future. So please have a look in the chat and write to the chairman who is taking part also uh, in this um, uh, webinar. Right, feel free to write to Mr. Ramil Iskandarli, chairman of the Azerbaijani National NGO Forum. Last but not least, please do not shy. Come back to me via email, find me via LinkedIn, and tell me what you think it's important that we shall consider to be useful for the civil society organizations in this type of discussions. Thank you very much. Uh, seven minutes over. I wish you a beautiful afternoon. And uh, until next meeting of the civil society organizations organized by ETF. Thank you, speakers. Thank you, organize, uh, technical organization, and uh, goodbye. Thank you, Margaret. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone.